So, uh, good morning. Uh, my talk for uh, this forum is uh, Decision Making and Management of Osteoporotic Vertebral Compression Fractures. And uh, so, we all know that osteoporosis is a skeletal disorder which is characterized by compromised bone strength, predisposing a person to an increased risk of fractures. Uh, bone strength primarily reflects the integration of bone quality and bone density. So, once the, your T score on a DEXA scan is less than minus 2.5, we label these patients as, my, as, as osteoporotic patients. And before I start this uh, particular talk, I just want to highlight with this particular table that no treatment, whether conservative or surgical, whenever we decide for a particular fracture is complete without knowing the or starting the medical treatment of osteoporosis. I'm not going to the details of this, but medical treatment form is an integral part of any, any, any form of uh, management for osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. So uh, when we talk about decision making in, in, uh, in osteoporotic vertebral uh, spine fractures, uh, basically the decision has to be, first decision has to be made is whether you really need to operate the patient or you can, you can conserve the patient. So, uh, you know, to answer this question, it is very important for you to understand the morphology of the fracture, which is there. And you look at the x-rays. Uh, this was initially propagated by uh, Sugita et al. in 1995, which was an x-ray based classification. And he classified the fractures into five types. Uh, you can see on the left hand is normal type. Then you have swelled front type. You have a bow shaped type and you have a projecting type. And then you have a concave type and a dented type. So all these morphologies can be seen on an X-ray and can be identified. And according to their observations, patients who had a swelled front type or a bow shaped type or a projecting type, these are malignant forms of, uh, you know, vertebral compression fractures of osteoporosis, which probably would lead to a complication like a further collapse or kyphotic deformity, which may lead to a neurological involvement. So such cases or such fractures, when seen on X-ray, they just cannot be just conserved. They need to, you know, you need to deal, deal with them aggressively, maybe with a surgery, right? Whereas when you see a pattern like a concave type or a dented type, these are benign types of osteoporotic collapses and patients who have this kind of a picture, they can be conserved. By conservation, I mean they can be treated with a brace, with medical management of osteoporosis and with analgesics, and we can expect good healing in these kind of fracture patterns. Whereas the lower three ones, that is swelled front type, the bow-shaped type, and projecting type, they are known to be notorious and can cause delayed complications. Now, this was an X-ray based, and this was in 1995, which was given by Subita et al., which was further upgraded in 2018 by the classification of osteoporotic thoracolumbar spine fractures, recommendations of the spine section of the German Society of Orthopedics and Trauma. And they came up, came up with the classification which was based on all the modalities of radiology which are available. That is the X-ray, the CD scan and the MRIs. And they came up with again five types of uh, OF uh, or the oste osteoporotic fractures. Uh, and the first two types wherein you see the edema in OF1, the whole body edema, and the OF2, which just has little bit involvement of the uh, posterior wall, less than one fifth of the posterior wall, and only and only involving the upper or the lower end plate. They were supposed to be the nascent ones, and they can be treated conservatively. According to them, they prognosticated that. And if you have any picture wherein there is o o C o o OF3 or OF4, that is involvement of both the end plates or there is, you know, disintegration of the shape of the vertebra or there is a rotational component to it like in OF5, then I think they, they, they propagated that, you know, uh, surgery could be a better option to prevent low, late complications in osteoporotic spine fractures. So this is how you basically make a decision whether you need to operate this patient or you can conserve the patient. So that is the first decision that you always make when you see a patient with osteoporotic spine vertebral compression fracture. So once you have decided that you have to operate this patient based on the pattern of the patient, uh, morphology of the fracture, then the other thing starts as to how to start, what are the strategies to implement as to how to improve your fixation 
or what exactly you need to do. So surgically, we either take care of the pain of the patient or we need to stabilize and decompress uh, the spine. So basically, the problem with osteoporosis is that osteo osteoporotic spine, however, causes problems in management, particularly where instrumentation is involved, resulting in screw loosening, pull out, pseudoarthrosis, or adjacent segment fibrosis. Osteoporosis alters the biomechanics of the bone implant interface, resulting in various degrees of fixation failures. So basically, since the bone is soft and we are going to put a hard implant into the bone, there could be all these problems that have been labeled just now. So it is very important for you to strategize your uh, fixation and there, there, there are multiple ways to improve your fixation when you are dealing with osteoporotic spine fractures and you have to do a fixation. So this, when we, when we come to fixation part, let me divide the things into two very broad categories. One is that how do you improve your surgical technique? That is one. And what are the implants or novel things that are come that are there in the industry or with you, which you can which you can use to improve your pull out strength. So when we come to basic surgical technique, there can be things like you can increase the diameter of the screw so as to get a better purchase in the pedicle. You can increase the length of the screw. You can use a small pilot hole and then put in a larger diameter screw there. You can do under tapping of screw track. You can have a longer construct. So you can take multiple you know, points of fixation so as to produce a stress on the implants there. You can do a supplemental anterior fixation or an anterior reconstruction. You can use laminal hooks or wires because that is what is only, you know, laminal hooks and wires are basically holding the cortical part of the, of the vertebral, uh, vertebral column. So the fixation is uh, better. You can use, use transverse connectors to again, you know, uh, disseminate the stresses on the implant. Then there are noble surgical techniques which are there by using a double screw technique or you can use a bicortical screw technique. So what you do is you put a longer screw engaging the pedicle and you put such a long screw that you engage the anterior cortex of the, of the vertebral body so as to improve your uh, pull out strength there. Or there's another trajectory which is known as cortical bone trajectory which has been utilized in mid lifts. So you put your screw only in the cortical part so there is no cancellous. So, uh, so the pull out is better as compared to a routine pedicle screw. Now the other concept is novel screw or a construct. So you can use expandable screws, you can use injectable pedicle screws through which you can inject cement to augment your screws. You can use coated screws, which could be, you know, hydroxyapatite coated. Uh, and obviously you can do cement augmentation. You can do prophylactic vertebroplasties. And there are multiple other things by which you can improve your construct and which, by which you can improve your pullout strength of your screws. So let me impart this with the help of a few cases so that we, I, I should be able to give you the right message. So uh, this is a simple case. Uh, she's a 65 year old lady. She has severe pain in the back for four weeks with multiple comorbidities like SLE, diabetes, colitis, hypertension, CAD, Parkinsonism. And she has severe osteoporosis with a DEXA scan of minus four in the spine with a neurologically normal patient. So the main complaint is back pain. So, you know, uh, when we deal with such patients and you, you don't want to keep these patients on bed for a long time, and you don't want them to suffer also because of the pain. So the best thing to do for such patients is, these are the X-rays of the patient. There is hardly any instability, but the patient has very severe, severe pain which is making her life very difficult to live. So uh, these are the MRIs and what we did was a simple procedure in the two vertebrae which were fractured, which were showing edema. We did kyphoplasties for that. Now, when do you opt for, the another question could be, a decision making could be, what do you do? Whether you do a vertebroplasty or what do you do a kyphoplasty? So basically the difference is that in kyphoplasty, you are inflating a balloon prior to injecting the cement. When you inflate a balloon inside the bone, you create a void there. So the advantage of this is you can inject cement, which is more viscous. So the chances of leakage are much less in a kyphoplasty. Whereas in vertebroplasty, since you are not using any balloon and you have to push cement, you're likely to use cement, which is less viscous. And the chances of leakage are a little higher in, <coughs> in vertebroplasty as compared to the uh, kyphoplasties. So, <coughs> So uh, basically, kyphoplasties and vertebroplasties are pain management modalities, which are done only to take care of the pain of the patient. Uh, another case, 98 year old male, otherwise healthy, neurology normal, severe pain in the back. And you can see it is a pincer type of fracture that is OVF4, if you remember your classification. Now, this is a situation wherein you need to uh, you stabilize a simple Pain relief cannot be there because this is likely to go into kyphosis and cause more further complications. So we decided to do a 
good job for this guy and we did a hard job with with a cement augmentation and we did a percutaneous fixation and we also did some vertebroplasty just to augment the uh, the anterior 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 vertebra and he did quite well so uh, that's also because the fracture opened up now another case uh, 76 year old male severe back pain and radicular pain it's a long standing old fracture and pain was so bad that he could not even sit neurology was normal there were no co mobilities and uh, dexta lumbar was minus 4.3 so in the x ray you can see there is a fracture of l4 which is an old fracture and probably it, because of the instability uh, which you can see on the flexion and extension views it is opening up on extension uh, uh, this is a closer view of that and it's an old fracture the patient had back pain and he could not even sit and he had very severe radicular pain on both the legs because of this you can see the central part is not that badly stenosed but if you look at the foramens on either side uh, on the mri they are very badly stenosed probably because of the chronic instability which he had because this patient was initially treated conservatively now we had to do something the 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 uh, the principles of surgery for this particular patient would be to stabilize because there is instability, to decompress because there is foramenal compromise, and to stabilize in such a way because this is an osteoporotic patient, you need to stabilize in such a way that your pullout strength becomes uh, uh, is not compromised. So what we did was we did this: we did augmentation of our screws at L5 and L3. We also inserted two screws in L4, which was a fractured vertebra, to improve the overall strength of the construct. We did an interbody and we did a good decompression. We also added a prophylactic uh, vertebroplasty at the upper level so as to prevent any adjacent segment fracture prophylactically, uh, just to make sure that our construct lives longer. So this patient was very happy with the surgery and he did very well. And it's been almost three, four years down the line since this patient has, has been operated. And this patient is doing very well. There has been no signs of any loosening cement and the screws are holding very well and the patient is doing very well. La another case uh, by, through which I want to give my message is, uh, this is a 61 year old female patient with a history of trivial fall. And she had complaints of weakness of the lower limbs with frankel grade C and with involvement of bowel and bladder. You can see there's a fracture there and uh, there is kyphotic deformity which is there and patient looks very severely osteoporotic. This is the uh, x-ray and the MRI. You see there is a uh, retropulsion of the fragment there. Probably it's an old fracture and there is no anterior uh, you know, uh, structure which is there and there, that's causing instability and causing compression of the cord. So now the problem, uh, the, 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 this has to be very nicely dealt with because when you treat such patients, the idea should be to stabilize because there's a fracture and there's instability. And you want to, since you are dealing with an osteoporotic patient, you would probably like to augment your screws so as to have a better pull-out strength. At the same time, uh, there is no anterior thing that is going to, you know, uh, so if you do not do any, any anterior reconstruction in this patient, it is likely that there'll be too much of stress on your posterior implants. So probably I think you anyway have to decompress. So I thought of doing a corpectomy for this particular patient because I wanted to recreate anterior, anterior uh, structure or reconstruct the anterior structure so as to produce, uh, I mean, to, uh, to you know, put less stress on my posterior implants so that my implant or my construct lives longer than what I said. Then it would be if I do not do an anterior reconstruction. So probably in this particular case, I would think of an anterior reconstruction definitely and do a decompression and stabilization and stimulant formation. And this is what we did. So uh, we went two levels up and two levels down. We augmented our screws with cement and uh, we did a corpectomy, decompressed the cord nicely and we had put in a cage. Retrospectively thinking, this case looks like the X looks very good. But only thing that if I critically analyze my own x-ray, I would probably do put in a bigger cage because the larger the cage, it would, you know, surround the end plate nicely on the more stronger parts of the end plate. And uh, the chances of sinking of the cage would be even further reduced. Otherwise, this is a very well-performed case, very nicely done. And the patient did very well. She improved drastically and she started walking. And it's been almost, again, four, five years down the line. And uh, she's doing well. Um, so these are the cases which are through which I wanted to give you my message and uh, just to add on to whatever cases I have shown and whatever I do whenever I treat these osteoporotic patients is uh, medical treatment is essential. 
I do start them with, uh, you know, uh, Tenusumab or I start them with uh, Teriparatide uh, based on uh, multiple things. Uh, medically, I have to see uh, what is right for the patient. So the medical treatment always forms the integral part of any of these patients which are being treated. So to conclude, uh, uh, basically you need to decide whether you have to operate or conserve based on the morphology patterns which I have told you. You could follow Sugita et al, you could follow the other classification which I showed. Uh, then you need to have various strategies that in case you have decided to operate, how would you improve your fixation, whether it will be uh, you know, a longer screw, the bicortical screw, a bicortical purchase, or segment augmentation, or various other strategies which we discussed recently just now. And again, I want to highlight that medical management is an integral part of the treatment, whether you do a conservative treatment or a surgical. Thank you so much and uh, I would be willing to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much.